The visitors introduce themselves. And so they're, for those of you who aren't new yet, who everybody knows, um, would ask for introductions. And Brian, would you start? Please <laughs> say your name. So, hi, I'm Brian Lings. I'm here representing Houston and Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Mark. Well, I'm Sitting in for here. Sitting in for here. Okay. Let's go to the folks visiting us virtually. Um, Karen, would you introduce yourself? Sorry, um, it, the sound is really, uh, you can hardly hear anything on online. Uh, my name is Karen Guzman-Newton. Do we just need to speak louder? Is it because of the echo? Um, I, it, I'm not exactly sure. I couldn't hear anyone. I Ben, I could just hear you right now, but um, Forrest, it, it was really difficult to hear you and then anybody else in the room. Okay. All right, focus on enunciation. Ben, can you turn up the microphone? As he's cramming food into his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Is that any better? Hello. Uh, ben, you're good. Uh. And while Ben works on the technical solution, let's ask Melissa to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Melissa Jeffers. And Carly, are you able to hear us? Carly, my teeth. She's not even busy. She's not even busy. Well, she does have to work. She does have to work. So then uh, let's go around the table. And uh, Chris, would you introduce yourself? Chris Wilson, number four. Um, August Grant, the economic development director for the county. Okay. Megan McFall, uh, U of Utah State University for first development and small business development. Chris Berry, American yeah. Strategic Development Director. Ben Alter, economic development specialist. Forrest Rogers, uh, director of Moran Museum, and your presiding officer today. Mm -hmm. That means I'm trying to control this chaos. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you all for being here while we get the technology settled to the degree possible. We're, we're obviously doing this in a room and space that's unfamiliar to us and um, doesn't have the, um, the uh, resources that the county commission Romance. So we're going to do our best to make sure that people out there can hear us. Um, we have several items to attend to at this point. Uh, the first, we've done the welcome, we've done the introductions, um, a request for volunteers who need to speak to the conflicts of interest, disclosures, or ex parte communication. Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to that. Citizens to be heard. I assume most of us are citizens. And um, presentations, if any, and we have no presentations, at least not yet. Um, we have a great agenda today. I just want to say a couple of things about the way this agenda has been constructed and why we're going to do today what we're going to do so we can move to the main meeting 
at which we need to formalize recommendations that can be presented by the board and by the by the uh, staff to the county commission for action at the June 6th board uh, commission meeting. Um, we're doing that because we have some deadlines that um, are going to smack us in the face on June 30. And um, we want to help do everything we can to help the uh, August and the team be prepared for that. And so a lot of today is going to be providing some background information and some perspectives that we haven't um, focused on in, in a more, we haven't focused on, we've talked about a lot, but we haven't focused on. Um, and just one other thing that's more of a procedural thing, um, it, Ben suggested, and I think it's a great suggestion that if and when we come to a vote, we'll do a ro roll call vote. So we don't spend our time trying to figure out who's online and who's um, voting what and when. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, you're welcome, Ben. Um, <laughs> at the end of this meeting, I'm going to take the advantage of saying a few things about Ben um, and his service to the county because many of you know he's going to be leaving. In fact, today is your next to last day. Next to next last day. So this is your anti penultimate work. <laughs> Okay, um, so um, the first thing, the first item on the agenda we're going to go to is the approval of the minutes uh, from February 22nd and March 29th. If you've had a chance to review them and uh, suggest that they're acceptable um, and approval as distributed, I would entertain a motion to do that. I make a motion to exactly. move. Okay. So Chris and Megan? Sure. Okay. Good <laughs> Good enough. Okay. Um, then uh, moving on to the item B on the agenda, which is the I'm sorry. I think we have to vote. Do we have to vote on those? Yes, we do. Yeah. We have a motion. It's been seconded all in favor. We're going to use the road call vote um, process. So we begin with Chris. Aye. Okay. Uh, Forrest, aye. Karen? Aye. We're asking you to vote. Aye. Okay, she's an aye. Um, Shaylee is not here. Kelly is not here. Melissa? Aye. Where yeah, is? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring that out. Okay. But we got aye votes from both of them. Yeah. Oh, we did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just to be Then we'll move on. So the agenda item B is the uh, prioritization balance of the TRT diversification of rural county grant funds. And to do that, we're going to turn to the August August. All right. Um, can we check something again? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, could you say something? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, could you, not did you? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Did you say something again? Nope. <laughs> okay, uh, once more. So can anyone hear us? No, not well. We can, I can hear you very well. There we go. Okay, Melissa, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It takes a minute when someone else in the room is talking and it shifts, but yes. Thank you. All right, uh, then can you let me screen share? Uh, yeah, it should be right. Let's start with uh, the diversification dollars. All right, and then I might see if I can't zoom in on this with the kind of swag. Okay, um, so Chris and I, and, and you know, Chris, if I miss anything, don't like, but um, 
So obviously on the diversification side of TRT, um, with the changes to state law um, that are going to repeal the allowable use of economic diversification activities from TRT effective July 1st, um, Chris and I have been working to basically figure out how much money we are going to have available to us um, to allocate towards those uses before the allowable use is repealed. Um, and so that's a combination of actual spend in the past, forecasted spend through the rest of the year, liabilities and all the rest. Um, some of the numbers are still in play, but the important one is basically that this, this number is what our estimate is at the moment, plus or minus a couple of uncertainties. Um, Chris, going to speak to like what the range could be that we're looking at on the size of the budget. Well, we still need to project um, staffing costs through the end of June. Um, so I would estimate that that could be you know, 100,000. Um, <clears throat> so I would say between 750 and 850,000, you know, is going to be available to spend on diversification activities prior to July 1. So that's pretty significant. Um, and that's that's all uncovered. So the SBC contribution, the second piece of the start grant, all of that money is accounted for in the liabilities call. So um, you know, we find ourselves yet again in the situation of hurry up and figure out how to spend the money effectively. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. Um, but I, I first want to uh, do the same thing with the rural county grant side of things as well. So we have a clear view of kind of total funds that we have. A little smaller. So the original request um, to the state is this column. So 75 for workforce housing support, 75 for child care support, 25 for the summit, and 25 for um, Vista. The workforce housing support we've allocated 18,000 already, um, leaving a balance of 57 grand. Um, at the last county commission meeting, the 75 grand in child care um, programming uh, has been allocated. So that's there's nothing left to be allocated there. And then the 20, 25 grand that was kind of slated for the summit and the VISTA costs. Um, Chris has recommended that we pay for that out of the diversification pot. Um, and to leave that basically means it frees up another 50 grand that's not allocated out of the rural county grant side of things. Um, and that could, you know, the, the probably the easiest route there is to tap that on some of the workforce housing support projects. Um, but also, it's not it's not limited to that amount. Um, the other thing that uh, we'll chat about here um, is the handful of workforce housing support projects that we've been proposing um, with our community partner members that Chris has been kind of leading on. So you can speak to us about that. Um, and then separately, uh, we kind of started to brainstorm and have been working on a list of potential programs and process for the rest of the diversification funding. Um, so I don't know if we want to start with the housing or if you want to start with the diversification stuff. I mean, it's kind of one way or the other. It makes sense to start with the diversification. That's okay. the largest amount of money that we, we okay. have to put to good use. Let's do that. Okay. And threw some slides together that I'm gonna pull up here. Just for reference. So I think the biggest part of this um let's see if I can back Sure. 
I think the biggest piece that we're kind of thinking through here is how do we move quickly and transparently and effectively? Um, and so, you know, Chris and I, and Ben and I, we've all kind of started to think about and start to source the potential projects that are evergreen shell ready in the community. Um, that will kind of go over in the next slide, but, um, you know, I think ultimately trying to avoid at some level some of the, uh, you know, we have a lot of criticism of the Star Grant program uh, for not being transparent enough or not being, you know, a lot of criticism skeptic. So if we're going to go do this, wanting to make sure that at the very least there's some level of like transparency and public input available into this process. Uh, was something Ben and I were talking about trying to figure out how do we do that in like a month. Um, and so one thing we were thinking about potentially considering, which we put on this list, is um, you know today go over kind of a, a sketch of, of kind of proposed potential options that are either in our inboxes that have budgets and proposals um, and or kind of concepts and ideas. And doing a grand county connects kind of just a survey that says this is what we're considering. Please provide your input and kind of say this is good, this is bad, whatever. And, and, um, and then bring that to the county commission um, for a workshop on the 16th for the second May meeting uh, and have a joint kind of EDAB county commission meeting to discuss options on the table. Not recommend taking any action at that point, but. To consider everything, consider the feedback from that survey, and then the next you get a meeting on the 24th, at which point you know, the advisory body would consider some recommendations on rural county grant and diversification and pass forward a kind of a recommended slate of proposals to be actually considered in contract form at the June 6th and 8th, um, which would give us you know one additional meeting in June if stuff got stuck and had to get pushed back. Um, I think another important thing Chris clarified the other day was in communication with state auditors that so long as um, the, <clears throat> the spend or the contract is a liability on our books before the end of June 30th, then the checks can be cut at a later date. Um, so that's, you know, obviously there's a lot of tricky, what, what are the actual rules, right? The state's statute has the rules, but, you know, we, we accrue. We don't know how much money we made in May and June until July and August. Um, and so it's hard to actually spend that money until that day. So anyway, we did do the rule for that. Do you want to speak to that at all? Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, I mean, there's a two month administrative delay. And so the TRT is collected, doesn't get to us until two months later. And so uh, state code requires that we Operate using a modified accrual or accrual basis of accounting. And so typically we don't worry about accruals until the end of our fiscal year, which is a calendar year. But uh, this particular statute, HB 416, is based off the state fiscal year, which ends uh, June 30th and will start on July 1st. And so <clears throat> I was working with our auditor on the question of could we consider the TRT that comes in in uh, July and August to be for the prior state fiscal year? Uh, and the answer was from them is yes, and it is in fact that money, uh, which is you know a sizable difference between not because we accrue January and February back to 2022 the money that comes in is our bank, and if we weren't allowed to accrue. Uh, to the end of the state's fiscal year, then we would have four months with TRT uh, for economic diversification as opposed to six. Um, so we had to work through all of those technicalities. And I think, you know, at this point anyway, um, our auditors are comfortable with us accruing that money into the program. Of course, we won't know exactly what it is, so we're going to have to be, you know, my projections and the dollar figure we looked at are probably. Much lower than what it will actually be, but we run the risk of overspending if uh, if we you know try to get too close to actual projections. And so these are fairly conservative projections. You know there could be more available, um, but we wouldn't really know because the money won't come in until after we had to commit to spending it. 
So it's a little bit of a conundrum there. Um, but if we, you know, run off conservative projections like we are, then I think we'll be fine. Um, and so at this point, you know, I think it's it's just a matter of brainstorming ideas for how we can spend that money. Um, private July one. And I think that, you know, that's what this timeline is, is discussing, uh, including uh, some public feedback. And then getting to the commission on June 6, which would give us time if the commission decides that they're not ready to approve it, that there'll be one more meeting after that to get it done before uh, before July 1. Um, and so we it's a consolidated timeline, but uh, we do have to move fairly quickly on this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like my idea is, uh, at this point, are, are generally threefold. You know, one would be to extend our um, involvement with SBDC out further. Uh, we committed to three years and we could extend that commitment. That's one option that I have in mind. Um, another is to make a, another contribution to the uh, community center. Is that what they call it? Yeah, the, uh, so this is, this is the that I put together. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And so, you know, <clears throat> a, revol uh, a revolving loan fund is also a possibility here considering the amount of money. But I would think that if we went with a revolving loan fund, that it's almost be uh, an instance where we'd be taking that entire amount of money and dedicated to revolving loan fund. <clears throat> so, the Moab Free Health Clinic, uh, Community Resource Center, um, did some, we went over there and poured around and told them that we might have some money. Available, they were able to take the hundred thousand that they received from the start grant and uh, use that um, as match money to get over a million dollars additional funding. So they're very successful with uh, the start grant. Uh, I think that there's what probably like at least fifteen different entities operating. Yeah, under their roof. So it's a uh, really uh, well. I mean, it's really well established for how. Young, you know, as as a as a project, so I'm I'm pretty impressed with them. I think it'd be a safe bet to invest in that as well. Uh, you want to cover some of these other ones? Yeah, but quickly, can you flag Melissa's question? Yeah, uh, Melissa, do you want me to read out your question, or do you want to just ask real quick? Sorry, I just have a list. <laughs> um, you know what? It doesn't matter. You can read them off, or I can ask, and then I have one more based on this slide, but I can hold it to after. No, that's fine. I'll just read what you put in the chat. So we're wondering, um, you know, how much later can the checks be cut after the liabilities occurred? You have an opinion? Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't, we typically would never agree anything past uh, February 24 for the prior year. So there's pretty much a cutoff for approvals um, for 2023, which is going to be at the end of February of 2024. So that's when we stop accruing according to a lot of my accrual basis. So it would be like the latest possible potential time that we would cut a check. You know, yeah, yeah, because if it's, if it's after February of 2024, then it's going to go on 24th first. Got it. And the other question was uh, where the diversification funds go if they're not spent? Uh, the towards the question. Yeah, and Melissa, if you had any other questions, go for it. No, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer to that one. So where do they revert if they aren't spent? Do they stay with the county or does it go to? It goes to the tourism promotion uh, budget. Got it, okay. I'm with you now, it's, perfect. It stays in the county. Got it, okay. So yeah, I mean, it would stay with us, but um, the diversification activities provision is being repealed. So it won't even be an sure. option. Um, the way that the statute reads right now, um, up to one fifth of the money that goes to economic development can be spent on recreation, film, or conventions, and the re remainder has to go towards tourism promotion. So, four fifths of the budget will be tourism promotion, one fifth can be rec film and conventions after July 1. After July. Okay, so. Um, with that in mind, I think what would be useful for this conversation as a discussion, I can maybe go over some of the things on here um, that, we've, that we've already discussed. And um, I think 
the, the goal of this would be so that by the end of the week, um, our team can put together kind of a community of services. These are kind of a sketch of the types of programs that we'd be considering funding. We have a tight turnaround. We want your input on, um, you know, write things that look good to you and suggest things that would be useful for you um, if we don't already, you know, have them on the list, and then there would still be an opportunity for input at that workshop uh, in May. Um, so I'll go over this, and I think what would be good is if we can just kind of go around and, and kind of pop some suggestions and, you know, for, you know, everybody's going to have some good ideas. So, so some things on here, obviously, I think the rotating line fund is, you know, can kind of still got any remaining funds. Um, it's not something where a certain amount buys a certain amount. The more that's in there is the more that gets kind of in the rotating line fund in perpetuity that would then cycle through and have just be administered by the Association of Governments. They said that they'd be more than happy to do that and um, would be restricted to our business between the county. Um, so that's not, not a bad idea, but um, there's a certain amount of, yeah, and then you could cost would be borne by us, it would be borne by the AOG. And having seen that program work, um, it is still alone, right? So it's, it still comes with all of the processing and repayment obligation and collateral and, and it can get, Somewhat messy sometimes. Um, so the, the other piece here, the first one, um, is that Ben was basically supposed to be promoted in January, um, but it was positive to be um, uh, the old process, which was seen, and so um, that never happened. So there's a consideration of potential, you know, um, back promotion and back pay of that uh, additional funding of what he would have received if this hadn't happened. Um, the Moab, Moab Free Health Clinic Resource Center project, um, they proposed uh, about $500,000 worth of projects that they didn't choose from, um, including um, some facilities improvements, including some space for the Department of Workforce Services and the Korean Technical Education Services that USU Moab provides. Um, some uh, initial work that would drive a housing complex that they're trying to put on that property and additional you know, infrastructure improvements. Um, ben, you put on the Wildcat microphone. What was it about there? I know we talked about that talk before. The yeah, when I was doing the meeting minutes for one of our last meetings, um, this came up when Shaley was discussing the Chamber of Commerce's idea to uh, empower local students through business pitch competitions. And then Megan had brought up the micro fund and talked about how that could kind of augment that or be you know, a similar program that achieves that name. So Megan, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about the micro fund. Um, I know we talked about it before, but maybe like a refresher as well, how much you think it would take to implement and like get going in Grand County. So the Wildcat Micro Fund is a, um, it's essentially seed money, but we can work with businesses up to five years that are making more than $5,000 a month in net revenue, which opens up a lot of opportunity. Um, we work with them, we create a, what's called a business canvas model, which is similar to the business plan. It's not quite as extensive, but we look at other areas of business or other areas of their business that you don't necessarily need in a business plan. And then um, we uh, create a pitch deck with them, and then they go and they pitch. They're only competing against themselves. So if they don't score high enough to get the money, they'll get the comments from the judges, they'll come back, they'll fix whatever um, items that they have, and they can go back and re-pitch to get their money. They can ask for up to $3,000 at a time. They do have to have a budget for that, just like in the regular business plan. Um, and they can go back and pitch. Right now, it's set at three times. Um, we have kind of talked about maybe moving that to up to five times in our rural and disadvantaged areas, which Grand County would be considered in that. Um, and so they can get anywhere from nine to fifteen thousand um, dollars as an on a grant basis. So they wouldn't have to pay it back. Start a fund um, or moving them on to that next level, basically to make them bankable so they can move into those other sources of funding after that. They have enough going to be able to put that. In order to get that going, I would need at least another business consultant um, to add the second I release that this is launched. 
it's going to get scary. I've already got 50 businesses on my wait list. So it's, I need a, another part time person to be able to, to fill that need. So it was about 30 to 40,000 to bring in another part time, another 10 for everything. So you don't need money for the fund itself. No, we have this. Yeah, we have $1.2 million that we got donated from America First. We just have to do figure out the administration of that. Great. Good job. Thank you. Um, I threw on here um, some kind of state investment, whatever that would go towards a long term kind of mixed use or uh, commercial space development of some kind. If there's a good deal out there that could be a potential purchase. Um, yeah. Or a single wide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's or or a public private, private match, whatever, just throwing it out there. Right, right, right. Um, I think there's a need for a commissary kitchen in our community that's brought up a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so if that's like if someone has a shovel ready project or something that they're ready to go, that's a potential kind of way forward. If anybody is kind of developing commercial space. These are two products that I've worked through the grapevine that are kind of mixed use potential consideration for development. Um, just kind of hearing through the grapevine to what you know, if there's something, if there's a project out there that we're just not aware of that additional capital could make happen. Mm -hmm. um, that's another thought. But that, this is kind of our initial path. So I think I'd open it up to anybody's input. What are we missing? What could be added to this list of consideration? Questions. Ben is going to be making things. I can add something. Please. Um, I was going to bring up the kitchen for sure because I know there's a lot of small businesses who would, would rent a space to do their commercial kitchen stuff. Um, and then I just had an opportunity to participate in a cohort for the women business owners through the SBA with the, the Ascent Pilot Program. And um, the, the Business Development Center in New Mexico has this space that is not only a co-working space, but also has space where people can go in and like record their um, advertising. So like yeah. a space where people can go and film for their commercials or for their, you know, their, Social, their marketing. Yeah, whatever. yeah. Okay. So, which was a really cool idea. And maybe a space that you really can uh, Oh, yeah, it's incredible. It's awesome. And it's what we, we modeled our Spark Center out of after. Right. So, yeah. So I would say anything that we could add to our small business development center would be good. Yeah. A co-working space, a commercial kitchen, those two things would have massive impact on the businesses that I'm working with right now. Mm -hmm. Um and to be able so those two are the ones that seem to me <laughs> funding for the wildcat fund that is puts more economic and capital than you should not. Um, so that would be really, really great. Um, but I also know you guys just gave us funding for a uh, full time person here, um, which is a full time job <laughs> as it is. So, um, but those are the ones that seem to me. Cool. You guys, wasn't there um, supposed to be a space at the new university, a kitchen space? Did that? There is. Yeah, there's a very nice kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. So, is it possible to? I don't know, I, you know, somehow yeah. work in tandem with somebody else yeah. who actually has. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a very nice kitchen. I, I don't know you, you and she intimately, but um, a very nice kitchen, a very nice sewing room, like kind of a whole. That's all on the know, extension in right, part. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's separate from the RDSU. Right. That's right. a good community engagement. Right? Is that available? For that kind of use, I don't think it is. That's for instruction. I think yeah. that that yeah, that's part of the extension setup. Uh, yeah. So can the um, these funds be allocated to county departments for any of these purposes? Specifically, I'm thinking of the commissary kitchen because the the grand center has what is effectively a commercial kitchen. Right. And and yet they could always use upgrades there. Um, that is the low cost venue for most organizations in town who don't have a hoodoo or some other place supporting them. Their projector doesn't work. You know, there are lots of ways you could make the grand center 
a more useful space for people um, and meet some of the needs of the commissary kitchen um, interest on, on the part of people. I don't know that I've never figured out for the Grand Center, but as you're talking about that, um, have you looked at the EDA grant for incubator space? Mm -hmm. There's an incubator one, and there's also what we call the university center. Um, so there's two um, I'm thinking of, but in to bring those two together, we're going to apply for those grants. And I know based on the because I was their conference two weeks ago, they've got extra money that they needed. <laughs> <laughs> so this could be match money. Yeah. So this is going to be match money yeah. for that. Yeah, that we, can, we can look into that. I mean, my preference would be to um, apply this funding as directly to local businesses as possible. Um, so I would tend to not want to spend it internally in any way or uh, minimize internal expenditures. I, I, when are you, you know, the, having the ability to actually use a space to, to come up with products, which is a direct link to helping local businesses. So, I mean, if it seems like we can figure out some sort of partnership and if it's, you know, through the university or through, you know, the Grand Center, I mean, this is, it's already done. I mean, why wouldn't we, I don't know, try to help those businesses that Megan is, you know, trying to, to get off the ground. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the venue itself is kind of, you know, these both of those venues would present a lot of conflict in just terms of scheduling yeah. and just integrating them with, with the your primary yes. directive that they have. And so, I mean, if we could find some standalone venue, then I think it would be better. Well, um, I have a question. Sorry, I, just to just to piggyback on what Karen was suggesting, I would be curious to hear what the conflicts are, because I think one thing to keep in mind is, and if USU has a facility that we could use as a commissary kitchen, or if the Grand Center has one that could be leveraged as a commissary kitchen, I feel like in order to be effective, there's an add-on on, on top of the facility. So for example, who can we bring in to talk about what are the requirements for bottling with food and beverage? marketing for food and beverage how do we provide that additional support on top and then how do you market and advertise to the community so that they know that those resources are available and that they can utilize those so there's a whole business plan involved beyond just saying hey we need a mop sink and a clean sink and here are the different things that we need in order for that to qualify or to be able to pass an inspection as a commissary kitchen I'm really liking the idea of what Megan was talking about earlier with her 50 businesses in the backlog of being able to help them all the way through the process of, hey, I have an idea for a food and beverage business. It can be profitable. That's going to create an asset for the community. And then to be able to help them all the way through that process, but not expending on another two ovens if we already have some that we can use or a large commercial refrigerator that's going to meet all of those commissary requirements. So I'm, I would be curious about, number one, what would be available at both the Grand Center and USU to be able to use as a commissary kitchen as part of an incubator or an accelerator food and beverage program? And then how we combat those conflicts? And then also, do we have a business plan or can we put a plan together to be able to say, and here are all of the other resources, because it, it's going to go beyond just space for them to be able to do that as a business, right? We're going to have to be able to help them with licensing requirements and, you know, sanitation requirements and then marketing support and all of those things. I would love to see some kind of a comprehensive plan around that. I think that'd be great. I think a lot of people are already existing businesses too that are asking for this space. They already have a plan for doing the business. They just need a place to use. Also, for as far as like the safety and everything like that, Utah State actually is the one that holds the licensing and things like that to do the certifications. And so that would fall under Utah State anyway. Um, whether that happens at one of our extension offices or out of Logan, um, we have all of that in place currently. Um, I did, um, I started a grant um, a year ago to do like a food hub, um, brought all of those 
pieces together. And so that's just a matter of uh, finalizing and, and bringing that, but that's all in place. I also have a full plan for an incubator kitchen and commercial kitchen, um, which required, because uh, I've been lucky to put one of those in since I moved down here three years ago. So. And I love that there are really great models in place for that spice kitchen in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. is a perfect example of how they take them all the way through commissary kitchen, like you were saying, with existing businesses, all the way to supporting them with food trucks. And I feel like that's where that rotating loan, loan fund also comes in handy, is being able to help support them all the way through the process. I really like that. So... Again, talking about like, well, if we don't do the revolving loan fund right now, there is a grant called RMAP through USDA. It's never been done in Utah, never been looked at. Um, I talked to them two months ago. They would love to bring that to Utah. So that is an opportunity that once they have all the infrastructure in place to back it, we can go after that and back that with something like the RMAP that is in place for this purpose. Too. Love so that. let's see. In the interest of time, I'm going to suggest that we put the lid back on that can of worms that we opened up because there's some great ideas there. And obviously, this has generated a lot of a lot more ideas or some response to these ideas. If you want to distribute this sometime in the next week, is that your target? Uh, going back to your goal would be to finalize some kind of communication and community input process by the end of the week and launch that on Monday. Okay. So what we want is to have the bucket of here's what we're already considering. Take a look at what we're considering and you know show us your preferences and in the other blank box tell us what we're missing. Okay. Um, and so we I think if you if you <laughs> I mean I, I'd be open to having um, you know, just make sure that we're not missing any new ideas in this room, and then, then you know, set it as soon as possible. Okay, well, is it possible then if people, having seen this list and having discussed it, can uh, respond to you, say, by the end of the day tomorrow, if they have additional ideas? No, um, no, 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 no. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's possible with the time that we have, if it would even be possible. But for me, the list isn't as helpful as understanding what's behind the list and what the plan for it would be. So like, for example, with the Moab Free Resource Center, the list is great and I can see a lot of things, but without seeing what the actual plan is, it's difficult to see what impact that would have on diversification. Does that make sense? So I don't so, know how possible it would be to see their plans. Yeah, we do have a slightly like a, a back, you know, a, a, a spreadsheet that has a proposal attached to it for that particular piece, and we can distribute that. I think the intention for now is to, you know, basically create a menu, um, get input on that menu, and then have more detailed input at the May sixteenth. Workshop and commission meeting. Does that make sense? So I think that this is an initial review, not a final statement of preference. If that makes sense. But as Melissa said, this is what would be distributed, correct? Without much more context. Yeah. So I mean, we'll put as much flesh on the skeleton as we have. Okay. When we send it out. So we'll do our best, and then uh -huh. we can distribute it. Yeah. Um, and then we have two weeks, effectively two weeks to continue to get proposals and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Um, is there another part of this? Not this next, no. Okay. Next, next we look at the housing programs. Girl yeah. kind of grant. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you. That is a really um, very diverse list of ideas and options. And uh, I can see supporting almost any one of those. So, um, Ben, do you want to pull up that proposal sheet? And then Chris will speak to, yeah. I believe, from the, I was actually not sure if that's Ben, you want to? Yeah, well, <laughs> well Kaylin, was, Kaylin just joined us. So, I think, Chris, I think it sounds like you're probably already just kick us off and you can sure. ask for support from Kaylin as needed. 
Sounds great. Okay, great. Um, I've got this sheet pulled up here. Just let me know where you want me to scroll at that. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, I think August got us started in terms of what the finances look like. Um, I don't think that we need to do background. I think we all know why workforce housing matters to uh, Grand County. Um, so it looks like, I mean, we have somewhere between 57,000 to maybe 107,000, depending on how some of those other items get moved to TRT funding within just the, the Rural County Grant Program that could be dead you know, could go towards workforce housing, but a minimum of 57,000. And this is all by the end of June also. So the idea here is to have some discussion around what some of the priorities are and talk about what some of the proposals that are out there are so that we are ready to sort of vote on things as of the following meeting next month. Um, there's really three things that came through, you know, when Ben and I sat down and we, we spoke with Caitlin of the Land Trust. Uh, I had another conversation with Ben Riley of Hatsu, and we were able to sort of whittle things down to three basic proposals, um, three, three sort of buckets of, of items. And so what you'll see on the sheet are four, and I'm gonna combine two of those um, as we sort of walk through them. So I'm gonna just run through them very briefly, and then the idea is to open this up to have some discussion. Um, the first one is to help get voluntary primary residents or workforce housing and deed restrictions of a program for them stood up. So Hasu has already had someone, one person in town, come to them and say, we'd like to deed restrict our home for primary residents so that a local gets this house in perpetuity. Um, and they helped do that, but very bootstrap. Like they, they didn't have really the legal support and framework in place to, to do that on an ongoing basis. Um, but with some funding, they could. Uh, and there are other people in town who would do it simply on a voluntary basis. In Vail, there's a program where they're actually incentivizing people to deed restrict in that way. So they're saying, what's the value of your home on the market without deed restriction? What's the value of your home on the market with deed restriction and helping make up some of that gap, right? So that's something to, to think about that we could all sort of, you know, maybe it's something that there people would like to do in Grand County would like to do in the future, but what could be done now would be to take advantage of people who would do it voluntarily. And what's needed is sign that program, lawyer, sign a contract, maybe some, Um, so that's one. That's, that's probably about fifty thousand dollars. Second one is impact fee offsets for workforce housing developments. Uh, I think we've identified the new uh, EDO, the alternative dwelling overlay campsites, as a particularly good use of this type of funding. And that's because so those are like these campsites that can now be developed um, using overlay for workforce use. They have some infrastructure at them, like bathrooms, for example. Um, in getting those, they have to pay impact fees. The impact fees, which is for like water and sewer, are larger as a portion of the overall cost of the projects for those types of projects than for traditional developments. Um, so we can make a big difference by helping offset some of that to make projects feasible that wouldn't otherwise be to get some housing for um, that is something that, you know, the impact fees are five or so thousand dollars per project. Um, so however, you know, however many multiples of $5,000 we put in a bucket, that's how many developments we need to support with it. Um, so it's a sort of flexible number associated with that one. Uh, and the third bucket is, um, supporting community infrastructure and road crossing, horizontal infrastructure. Um, so this is, you know, Arroyo, which is held by the Community Land Trust. There are lots of different types of development happening there. This would specifically be for the town home portion of Arroyo. Um, and they've received some funding through the community block grant uh, to help cover some of those costs, but could use additional support. Um, and this is another one, it's, it's sort of a flexible number because there's a total cost, but we're, we're not going to cover the total cost. So we would just be helping them get towards closer to the total amount or it's, you know, water, sewer, telecom, electric. Um, that would all be 
core homes that are for work, specifically deep restricted for workforce. I'm combining, let me just say why I'm making it three rather than four. After my conversation with Ben Riley from Hostel last night, um, the affordable housing research, which is on here, really decided that they are ready, you know, if there was funding, they could create the program rather than just push the program. Um, and so that's why the one on the front, that's the pilot about the deed restriction program would be the, the sort of the priority of those two. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is one. So let me stop there. And I think the idea is to open up for conversation. And, and Shaley, just to ask, so, so everyone should have access to this document. If you go to the um, invitation on your calendar, there's a link to access the agenda. And then this is an attachment with the item we're on right now, which is item B. So this is on the county. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Where is it on the agenda packet? Yes. Sorry. Okay. So I had a question about like how do we know how many um, projects might already be ready to use the um, the incentive for the impact fees? No, I think it's the, the short answer. We don't know for sure. But one thing I did get from planning zone, and maybe have some info on this, because it was that actually the commission's going to be considering approval of several sites at the upcoming commission. Yeah, meeting. there I want to say four projects that are going to be either approved or denied at the next country meeting. Um, and the pilot program itself is 150 sites, um, and about two thirds of them have passed with the first intent to apply round, and there's going to be another intent to apply period after the first batch applicants are approved at the next meeting. Um, so in general, it'll be 150 sites for people with trailers or tents or that sort of thing. For projects that are already applied. Yeah, already. That's the thing. So I'm not sure where you know, Grand County already has a policy of waiving impact fees for affordable housing project. This would be going to Glissa, who can't. Yeah, so yeah. Glissa doesn't. Yeah, yeah, this is mostly for Glissa. Yeah. And so that would be, when you say 5,000 per development, you're talking per, per individual unit. Yeah. That's probably, I mean, that's just a number I saw on a sheet. So yeah, so you can't explain it. They're going to stub in uh, water and sewer, you know, or provide water and sewer. I'm not sure how they would calculate ADU, ADU or ADO type thing. Um, it's probably not a full ERU, but typically, like EWSSA is impact fees for one ERU or maybe over 6,000. Yeah. yeah. And there are some developments, I mean, they range between like, eight sites to like 35 sites. So um, for certain developers who try to put on these in tens of thousands of dollars in impacts yeah. for just that specifically. Correct. So yeah, I mean it would be I'm not sure I it would be I would like to come back down to be assisted with charge for these ADOs individually. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's per site or if it's like some number of ERU per yeah, I mean they they'll probably have a calculation, you know, uh, a fractional ERU per site. Yeah, I, I think they have these as like these costs already calculated out for the applicants who will be approved or denied at the next commission meeting. I don't know what they are. Yeah. But these applicants now clearly already assume they're going to be paying these. Yeah. So exactly. would doing this open it up to applicants who maybe wouldn't otherwise do it? Well, the time frame for that is pretty much over, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there's another attempt to apply a period that okay. I'm going to say ends mid May. So pretty soon. Yeah. The okay. We have we got a lot of feedback on this at the, the housing series workshop. I can't remember what it was um, from developers who were saying that this is going to be a potentially significant cost mm -hmm. that was making them second guess yeah. applying for just uh, like from what I've heard in our office, a lot of people who passed the original intent to apply period um, for the ADO, they then did a lot of the homework about how much impact fees were going to cost, and they were bored. And, yeah. and there are some people who are like. I don't know if I can make this work out. Right. 
it's like the, the policy that you cannot. Yeah. Uh, so rather than like asking them to waive it or paying them, it would be a grant to offset that. Mm -hmm. you know, and then like, some yeah, I mean, you have to realize the impact is they're calculated on actual cost of providing the service. Right. <clears throat> and so if they get away, somebody else is going to have to pay. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's like, and and so that's why I mean, programming like this is. Is important because GWS at the same time we have a big revenue or you know, you know, big reserve to dip, dip into to subsidize. <laughs> right. If you wait but, one, everybody else. But it wouldn't surprise that. me if we're looking at five thousand dollars per site. Right. Yeah. And that's just for the impact fee. That's not including the cost of actually building the site. <laughs> right. So yeah, it can be pretty expensive. So August, you were saying that you've heard from developers through these roundtables that this might be and this might be an incentive or this might reduce a barrier. I think it's I think, yeah, I think for people who are all on board with this concept, as as Noel's pointing out, are kind of being um, blindsided by this cost and it's making them it's impacting the feasibility of the yeah. projects. And all like these costs, there aren't really like payment plans. It just has to be upfront costs before they have the revenue of renting out the sites. So it can be hard for the local folks to try and make this kind of make it that cost. Yeah. I don't mean to play devil's advocate here, but on the other side of, of things, I then wonder if if they can't afford that, are they going to be able to afford like the upkeep that we want so things don't start looking trashy? Like, I mean, this is a form of development that then gives them income. Yeah. I just on the, on the other side, like it does concern me for us to grant them pretty much a large, a large portion of the cost to develop this, and then it's like, okay, are you going to manage your money well and make sure that you take care of the rental properties appropriately? I, I don't know. I just I, I think part of building development is that you have to find the money, you have to be financially secure to do that in order to have this business. And so that that's my just a lot of kids side of things. And I think Ben, I would agree with you. He's mentioned that. I think we think I think that there's definitely a possibility this is a good product, but I think that also has even some skin in the game. Yeah. You know, yeah. so if we're if we're talking maybe giving like fifty thousand dollars, it's now we're talking about only 10 units too. So what's our impact? Mm -hmm. to, to Shaley's point I also you guys I'm sorry because it's kind of hard to um, hear the conversation but are these individual like local individuals or is, are these developers trying to do multiple sites I couldn't understand that like the ones that are in the queue right now yeah these are local property owners who are putting in between four and 40 sites on their own property. They're not like outside developers who are coming in. Um, oh, Karen, no. um, did you hear that response from Noel? I, I didn't hear Chris at all. What did Chris say? I just say one of the bigger ones, Patrick development, the owner doesn't live here. But I, I don't know if that's consequential. I mean, if it's providing local options for uh, workforce housing, I don't know that we need to worry about whether it's locally owned or not myself. Right. I just think we need to make sure we need to account that maybe we have them put skin in the game. How do, how do they apply to you know, this a really big, like a 40 unit property to me? Like, that's development. That is not just trying to solve a workforce housing problem. That to me is they should have the income. So, at what point do we go? Oh, we're going to help this person, but we're not going to help this person. How do we this this bypass? Like, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I guess I I would say that there is a market failure right now. Like the market on its own is not providing sufficient workforce housing, so there there is a need to intervene somehow and make it more affordable, make it more feasible for people to build these projects. Now, that doesn't mean that you make it free for two people and right. everybody else pays full price or whatever. I agree with your concerns there. Um, but I'm not personally concerned with the idea of subsidizing workforce housing Me either. because there's, you know, we're addressing a, a problem <laughs> that's clearly out there in the community. I just don't want us to solve one problem and add it anymore. Yeah. Like, what does this look like? I think we need to just make sure we have 
the right idea of the will is like Very if you waive the fees and you know so that these small property owners uh, developers can get their project underway and start turning it into an income source for them could we have something in the agreement that that, that they eventually pay it back that there's a lot of money in a bank yeah yeah like it's really wrong to give somebody you know, who will lay these fees but when you so really rotating workforce housing and that fee value yes yeah mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. yeah, they have to keep it and they keep the funds going. That's a great idea, Mary. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? If none, this has been a great discussion. Chris, thanks for setting this up for us and, and reducing from four to three the, the number of considerations. Um, as we move, look towards our next meeting, it makes sense then for, um, if you will, Chris, to, to collapse these three, these four into three, and um, the suggestion that Mary uh, put forward was well responded to, so maybe, I don't know, is this something that uh, no longer Ben um, crafts for us, or is that something, August, that you can work with? Yeah. So I, mean, I, I, what I what I would hear and respond to is I would want to ask, you know, the AOG, I and mean, they do the Howard Hill Fund program. So could they do it the fund of business development, but that's for like affordable housing? Yeah, this time. So we, I'd be happy to mm -hmm. explore that concept if they can administrate it, mm -hmm. um, and then we could make a contribution, whatever we can make, and then have it stand up. So I will do that for sure. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Any final thoughts or comments? So I think that for the next meeting, we want to have collect out proposals with costs associated for actual recommendation yeah. by the board. Thank you. Exactly. Moving on to the next agenda item. It's the review of the economic development strategic plan and it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, RFP. Uh, the RFP. Yeah, uh, well, we don't have a plan yet. Actually. Okay, so this is the RFP. <laughs> and we are not doing the planning today. <laughs> that ended up being a point of contention. It ended up being a point of contention. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Brian is here representing the Travel Council, and, and Vega is. Um, also on the Tribal Council, and um, August had a chance to talk about this process with, at the last Tribal Council Advisory Board meeting. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. No, okay. Sorry. And um, Brian, I, and Big, I don't want to put you on the spot. Jim was going to try to be here to um, provide th this group with some feedback from that discussion, um, recognizing it was two and a half weeks ago. Um, I have some <laughs> recollections. Yeah, I mean, I just think. one is the Tribal Council that um, obviously they can support you guys however we can. Um, and two, that if we have a stake in the direction that this board votes on, it would most likely be towards uh, workforce development housing. Um, that seemed to be the general consensus for everyone that they would favor, um, as well as um, Jenny wanted to make it clear as well that there was a lot of discussion also centered around the RFP that was going to be sent out. 
and the polling of citizens, and I think the, the board as well just wanted to voice that any kind of uh, anything that's going to be sent out to the general public for collection that we put more weight on year round residents rather than residents that are only here maybe once or twice a month uh, or just on three or four vacation properties. And that if there's a way to devise that, that's how that feedback would be collected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or so um, I, I can maybe, before we get into this kind of exercise of reviewing some of the component of the RFP, I'll just an update on how it's going. So it was, it was public. Um, thanks to everybody's kind of prompt feedback on the contents of it. Um, and the timeline is that it'll be open for a month, um, closing on May 12th. Um, the scoring committee, which consists of the Economic Development Board Chair, um, Pepper, I think you're deferring on that. I am, and Melissa has agreed to sit in on that. Yeah, so if no one, if everybody's okay with that, Melissa is going to represent the Economic Development Board on that scoring committee, unless anybody else is particularly excited about that and wants to fight Melissa about that. <laughs> uh, and then Jenny is slated as the Travel Council Board to sit on that scoring committee, myself, um, and Chris and Dylan Field from the county uh, are going to support those proposals. Um, and then the, the weeks of the 15th to the 19th and the 22nd to the 26th is going to be reviewing, interviewing, and clarifying proposals to try to get to a, um, a decision and getting contracts ready for consideration at the June 6th commission meeting. So and all of these processes are in parallel in many ways. Um, and that's due in part because um, a fair amount of the funds that are going to support that project are coming from this diversification piece that's been evaporating. Um, I have been very encouraged by the response that I've gotten from, uh, I've been kind of gathering a list of vendors over the last year and a half that does this work um, from colleagues and from conferences and send them to about 65 uh, contacts and have schedule, schedule some office hours this week and last to basically clarify the proposal uh, process. There's many uh, prospective applicants and sat down with about six firms over the last two weeks um, that had really, really good input on some having kind of a more background in, in tourism development, destination development background, really understanding tourism ways and some kind of coming traditional industry, industry, industrial recruitment, economic development background. Um, and I think that a good outcome is going to be a good team of both that's grounded in the reality of people who have a grounded, who people who are a grounded experience in what it's like to be in the gate with human beings um, and advice on those backgrounds. So I feel really good about the potential um, vendors who are going to be bidding on this. And um, uh, from a timing perspective, um, once the uh, contract is approved, then the idea with that this profits will start in July um, to go for about eight months and then kind of wrap up in time for the grand summit in February, March of next year um, for kickoff. And, you know, it feels a little hard before the house, of course, in a lot of ways to be having this conversation about how do we spend these $800,000, but, you know, it's the constraints that we have. And the goal would be that this process gets us to a place where we have a grounded understanding of where we're going as a community, as a commission, as a department, from everything from tourism, and promotion, marketing, you know, responsible recreation, sustainable quality of life, stuff, holistic, you know, housing, workforce, child care, all that stuff that helps everybody, and kind of the diversification priorities. Uh, and that's all in one place, and it's not kind of competing with each other as a priority. So I'm encouraged. I think we're in the right direction there. Um, and I guess any questions within the context of the process? I know Forrest wanted to dive in a little bit into um, some of the sections of that that we will be involved in when that process kicks off and get a head start on that. But does the process make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about it? Okay. I'll, I'll it's a county process. Oh, it? yeah. Yeah. We're, you know, we're buying, buying trust and going forward. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. 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 Brian, thanks for your um, summary of the feedback from the Travel Council. Uh, the other thing that I noted was a desire to get moving. 
even at this time of year to just, you know, this plan through nobody's fault has been discussed for. Well, the, the Economic Development Advisory Council recommended it as the number one thing to do with diversification dollars in December of 2021. Okay. So it's been a priority. As well, we're not going to go down the drain. We're going to drive up and <laughs> move forward. So, um, Circumference such a great event for this. <laughs> yeah. You're in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> uh, so we um, had a, a full a fulsome discussion at our last meeting about what economic development means to us and what economic diversification means to us. Um, we have the raw comments that is sought say the raw text from the comments that everybody um, ex made, expressed, and um, I took the liberty of just developing a summary of the key points and um, did that before we knew that we were going to be starting into this planning process. So um, it occurred to me that this would be a good time for people to review the RFP and note two things, especially. The first is that um, the language um, that has been crafted suggests that the consultant is actually a neutral facilitator um, and somebody who has some background in tourism-related and economic development and community building activities, but is not necessarily being engaged to just Develop, deliver to us their expertise, having worked in other places that aren't MOAC. And so um, I thought that was really important to reinforce. And in that paragraph, the statement that the expectation is that they will rely on whoever is selected will rely on the expertise of people in the community, people on this board, the travel council, people in the community. Um, we should not. Um, overlook the, the people who are involved with this community, but beyond it, like the State Tourism Department, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, small, small business development centers, and others who can help inform this process. Um, so in the packet was distributed, um, the front page of the RFP, and um, the second page was an area that I thought was specifically important to us. Um, this was in the very first draft that I saw of this document, um, where the expectation was that the consultant would implement a plan to define our objectives, our strategies, our vision and mission. And my response when I first saw that was, wait a minute, that's not a consultant's job. The department already has some de definitions of economic development with some very specific qualities or criteria, but not necessarily goals or longer term measurable uh, vision and mission. And it seemed to me, again, after the fact that the conversation we had at our last meeting actually surfaced a lot of the ideas that meet this particular section of the RFP. In other words, this is work that we've started to do with articulating a vision statement, articulating a mission statement, and more importantly, articulating what we want the community to look like and feel like. And that's what was, that's in what we distributed to everyone um, after that meeting. So it seemed to me that our next step would be to discuss how we can start working on that, taking what we've discussed before and starting to frame that into a recommendation to the county commission to articulate that, to, to approve an articulated vision for the community we're trying to build and the economic uh, infrastructure for that and put some specific goals, both longer term and near term, to that. And that's a working conversation process. Um, we have lots of ideas. We have people from the travel council who can help inform that. 
and um, to sort of set the tone because of Melissa's response to the RFP when August submitted it, I thought I would ask her if she would speak a little bit to two things that she said specifically. One was moving from sustainable tourism to a different term. Sustainable tourism is now the buzzword in the, in the travel and um, tour industry, and nobody really can define it. I shouldn't say that. Consultants can define that for you, but we have to figure out what that means for us here. And the other is a very simple description of the process that we, we use. And so I'm going to ask Melissa to give us a five to 10 minute background on that approach. And then we're going to open it up for a discussion about how we move forward. Um, it may mean that we're going to be asking people to work between this meeting and the main meeting to help craft some of these statements and put together the language we want to pre present um, to the county commission as we as we move forward. Does that make sense? So are you talking about doing this outside the context of the um, planning project? No. Well, thank you. What do you mean by outside? So, I mean, typically these consultants will come in and establish a stakeholders working group, which would include this board, travel council board, mm -hmm. commissioners, et cetera, yeah. steering committee. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, those folks would work together on what exactly what you're talking about. Right. right now. Yeah. So, I'm just wondering are you talking about doing this within the context of that, like that um, procurement of this planning process or, or separately? Not separately. But this, I think, is what sets up how we approach what we're looking for the steering committee to, to look at, what the, the people who are selecting the, the contractor to look at. Um, and it gets us all using the same language. All right. So, yeah, I, would just, I guess I would just, you know, warn against, like, having just this group do that by themselves, but outside the context of what's going to be a larger group of people. No, like we will. This group will be a part of this, undoubtedly. But so will the travel council budget board, right. and so we're you know with the county commission, maybe the you know planning commission. Um, right. So I'm just I'm just saying like if you're going to do this, it might it might be wise to wait until we pull that that larger group together and establish the ground rules for how everybody's planning mm -hmm. on the on the on developing the plan. And you know, given the amount of money we're spending on it, it should be a fairly uh, extensive process. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's a similar price tag due to our channel plan updates, which are very extensive and last for up to a year, mm -hmm. and oftentimes include um, several staff members from the consulting agency, not just a single consultant. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about a fifty thousand dollar plan. You know, they better have a, a whole team of people working for us. Mm -hmm. So that's significantly more than we thought we were going to be spending. So yeah, so we so got we just have a budget, right? Yeah. So this is going to be yeah, we're going to have an entire team of uh, planning professionals working on right. this with us. Right. Yeah. yeah, and then we also are the Vista that we be hiring. Um, be part of their job description to, to be adding the kind of on the ground capacity to facilitate this, helping set up meetings, engaging their communities uh, in this process. Yeah. We'll have that in house capacity to be coordinating, and I think I'll be really involved as well, but it's not my only job. Uh, but yeah, so typically when these proposals come back, they'll outline how they envision the whole process unfolding. And that would be a part of the selection process that we have to decide, you know, whose who's, who's process do we agree with? Right. You know? So it would be effective to have like a, refer, a representative of the board that makes sure that they go to all those meetings or a committee from this board? Um, it kind of depends. But again, I mean, we're pretty early in trying to even talk about this right now without seeing any of the proposals come back to us yet. Um, in the 
past with the general plan, for instance, you know, some of these working groups have been really large, like 30 people or more, all sitting in a room together, <laughs> you know, working through a lot of this stuff, which can be cumbersome, but you know, with these big planning processes, that's sort of how it how it oftentimes unfolds. And so um, I would I would envision that you know potentially the full economic development advisory board, the full travel council advisory board might be involved. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely cool. Um, and I think, you know, in addition, one of the lot of conversations we've been having with the um, OZERs, the potential vendors, is trying to figure out, you know, we're highlighting how can these dollars be most effectively used so we're not wasting much of your time traveling. Um, you know, how can we do as much of these meetings kind of remotely, but kind of staff the room we're having someone here in the kind of the note taker, but having a facilitator of program management being specialists. And um, so, you know, really trying to maximize engagements and ensure that, like, we're meeting the various stakeholders in our economy where they're at, whether it's, you know, in their neighborhood or, you know, in a rush of not necessarily saying this is going to be one meeting at the mark. If you missed it because you didn't have a babysitter, then they're going to have a say in the future of the economy. Um, so I think my I guess what I would absorb in both of these kind of thoughts and comments. I think my understanding where Forrest wanted to go with this was let's review kind of the conversation we had last time. Uh, and you know, just ground ourselves in that perspective going into this process as we're going to kind of seek uh, look at our proposals and go through this process from there. And then um you know, for, for some of this, I should say that the implementation plan, but not the implementation, but the an outcome and deliverable this process says, here is the five-year plan of actual implementation that the staff will go and do. Um, and I think when we were initially talking about this and potentially talking about this is like, what could staff and the board do more of if we had less capacity on the planning standpoint would be, okay, let's, let's, Let's hammer out a vision statement, mission statement, and some of these general objectives. Um, so, but I guess with that in mind, Chris's comments, I'm not sure exactly. Well, I mean, that would be one of their primary duties, right? To help us develop those things. Um, but you're saying it would be their job to help us develop our goals, our vision, and mission? Just, yeah, I mean, as facilitators. Pardon? As facilitators. Okay. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, I think it, the, the goal is they're not telling us what to do. They're capturing, they're hearing everything that the community is saying, the various venues that we're hosting, listening sessions, surveys, stakeholder meetings, et cetera, and distilling that into this is what we heard and lending an expertise that this is you know, what we're hearing you want. Uh, and that'll be a big part. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, with the $150,000 price tag, we shouldn't, I don't think that we should be uh, worried about any pension. Yeah. Um, you know, they should, whoever, you know, we will probably get a lot of proposals because there's a lot of um, firms that do this kind of work. And so I think when you, you know, see the proposals come in, they'll probably be very substantive. Yeah, I'm really excited. I know. Yeah, and I think they're going to, they should bring a lot of resources to the table. Well, and I'm hoping it gives us as a advisory board a really clear vision of what we're doing. Well, yeah, and a lot of you know, it still is going to come down to everybody that's involved at the local level actually crystallizing that vision. Um, and they can assist with that. Um, but yeah, it's, well, I guess what I'm saying is it's really going to be more than this board that, that defines what you're talking about. Because we need to bring in the travel council advisory board too, and and other players yeah, that are in the community that have a stake in this. And then ultimately, like with the general plan, they, they oftentimes will have one big public meeting that sometimes draws three hundred people. And in the past, they've had you know like you and Brock like like polling things that everybody has, so that they kind of do a live poll in the big meeting. I mean, there's a lot of different things that I've seen with these big planning projects in the past. Um, you know, but I would I would assume that there's going to be some significant um, public involvement as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to move on, um, Chris. I, I'm sorry that I was never informed about the $150,000 ticket. The last I heard, it was a thirty to fifty thousand dollar ticket with somebody primarily coordinating activity. Um, and I do recall that you had said a while back that we shouldn't be doing a, uh, a project at this scale because there was some uncertainty about the money. So uh, we just want to make sure that we're getting our money's worth because, in my experience, whatever you set the budget at, that's what they're going to respond. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that sometimes. Sometimes you know you they're gonna give you a proposal, the same proposal they could possibly give us the same proposal that they give us a budget for eighty thousand. Okay. So we're really gonna have a hundred fifty thousand dollar study that we need to hold there at least for fire and say we had our fifty thousand dollars worth of planning, yeah. which is very, very substantial, right? And if there's ever a question that I think this committee wants to chew on the subject of matter is you know, how do we manage our yeah. And to be clear, we've always talked about working with the travel council, other elements of the county, other departments that have an impact on this, and um, and then people beyond it. So, um, so we'll step back from that. And um, I was really a, we've we've got a board that has a lot of energy and um, perspectives and different expertise, and I was really uh, impressed when Melissa responded to August's distribution of the, of the RFP with some very specific things that I thought would be helpful to us. Um, and so I appreciate that she said she could give us some time today traveling as she is, but um, it's uh, almost 4.30. So Melissa, if we could do, have you, Describe those two things, those two items for the next eight to 10 minutes, and then we can have some uh, discussion about what our next steps will be in the future agenda items. You're muted. Muted. Thanks. I can go really fast, and then if people have questions or whatever they want to discuss in more depth or detail. Absolutely, then that leaves more time to do that. The one concern that I do have is that the feedback that I gave was not about the process or about the outcomes or what we're really looking for. I think no matter what we get in the outcome of the process, the, the most important thing is that we get something that we can implement. So hearing Chris's feedback, I'm concerned that at this stage, you might want to go back and have more people give more input into the actual RFP because it's quality in, quality out. So whatever it is that we're defining in our RFP that we're putting out there, we're only going to get responses back that are as good, as accurate, as helpful as what we were able to put out. And it also raises always just the concern with projects like this, that we get something that we can implement or that we're confident that we have the right people involved or a big enough group involved that we believe that this is actually something that we're capable of implementing because number one, we all agree that it's the right thing to do. And number two, we have the resources and the commitment to be able to put things behind that. So I just, I wanted to share that little caveat before talking about the couple of pieces of input that I had for the RFP. So for me, the input that I gave on the RFP was really, really specific to make sure that we're setting the bar to anyone who responds so that they know exactly what it is that they're responding to and that we get the best plan and the best buck. And then also that we get to hold some accountability so that if we get a plan back and we say, wow, this kind of falls short of what we were expecting or that we wanted, they're always gonna, they're gonna point back to the RFP and say, but here's what you asked us for. And this is what we delivered on. So my feedback was a couple of things that I had heard from the group prior just to really get some specificity. And the first one was, is that I had suggested that maybe we put in the RFP that we would like them to take an ABCD approach to economic development and whatever they give us back, which is an asset, an asset based community development approach to economic development, meaning it's a totally legitimate approach to say to, you know, a firm or whomever that we work with we want an economic development plan and they'll come back and say, okay, and here's how we can attract new business. 
here's how we can bring in development from these other types of areas, which is absolutely legitimate. And that's one approach to economic development. But in listening to this group, that's not the approach that I kind of heard everyone would prefer. So if we can be specific, if what we really prefer is an asset-based approach, then let's give them that information at the outset. So an, an example of that might be, hey, listen, we really think that we're good at food things and we want a, a commissary kitchen and we want to be able to put some resources around building out those types of things versus, hey, we would really like to attract a large food and beverage manufacturer to come in and employ our people. So that was one of the things that I had suggested. And then the second thing was, um, instead of saying sustainable tourism, that we switch that to the industry term regenerative tourism. And the reason for that in, in my perspective is that sustainable refers only to environment. And it's actually a really low bar. It's basically, hey, listen, let's not degrade this thing more than we already have if we can help it. And it refers only to the environment. Whereas regenerative tourism is, it takes a holistic systemic approach to tourism in general. And it says, we want tourism and that is going to benefit our community and build our community and bring in things. And it involves the economy. It involves individual participation in the economy. It involves environmental factors. But when the group that responds to our RFP sees our RFP, sustainable tourism is a little bit rough because it only involves that one environmental piece, which is hard to kind of negotiate or navigate in an economic RFP anyway. But then the other side of that is when we look at regenerative tourism and for everyone to do some research, it might be helpful. Um, if you look for Anna Pollock, she's done a lot of work for the past 20-ish plus years in communities that are a lot like ours around regenerative tourism. And there's a project called Visit Flanders, which is really, really helpful to look at too. It's one of the large economic development studies that have been done around regenerative tourism. And it just gives us a broader basis with a higher bar for the vendor that we choose to bring in a more holistic systemic approach to that than just environmental sustainability. So that was kind of the two pieces of feedback that I gave. Okay, yeah, so um, the, yeah. the binding commitment will actually be the contract that we sign with whoever. The RFP has already been noticed and put out there, so it's too late to change the RFP now. But um, I do think you make a point, that we, and we'll probably be able to um, integrate those into the contract mm -hmm. that we sign with the, whoever we yep. choose. And so, really drafting that contract is going to spell out exactly what oh, we're okay. expecting. Yes, yeah, so and I should say that um, what they said, you know. Um, included that asset-based community, community development language throughout the RFP. I'm receiving that input, so that's in there. Um, and then I left it as sustainable tourism for now because I didn't have a clear understanding of the difference between sustainable and regenerative. And the RFP really is more illustrative, I think, at Chris's point, than a binding terms and conditions. Um, and so in, in the body of the contract and in the kind of quick office hour conversations I've been having with the vendors, really being clear about prioritizing the fact that we're really trying to ensure that we have an economy that drives benefits to the community and, and uh, realistically addresses the costs associated with it. those economic choices um, is all together. So um, I think that the, the intent of the comments have been integrated and, and I think have so far been well received and I think have been absorbed by the people who I've been had talking to. So. Um, I think it's about uh, the, the, what you're introducing, kind of being a part of the process within your laptops. Sure. So, um, can we get a definition of regenerative tourism or a reference to something we can do our research? Yeah, we, we have on that. Do you have that already? And what was the name you said was a good person to read? So just before we got on, and again, we've been traveling all day, but I did do a quick, so the first definition that comes up when you Google 
Um, but there's a whole body of research and I'm happy to, you know, start a board or, you know, a public board with articles or, but the first definition that comes up is going beyond the concept of sustainable tourism, which focuses on, which focuses on neutralizing tourism's negative impact. Regenerative tourism is based on adding a positive impact to the local community and environment. So it's basically, and, and it's a really quick down and dirty formula, right? If you go out and you ask people in a community, hey, how do you feel about tourism? They're gonna list off the first few complaints that they have and then you say, okay, let's stop it tomorrow. Would you wanna stop it tomorrow? And then they'll probably tell you, hey, here are the reasons why I don't think that we should stop it or how it does add value. The measure of regenerative tourism is in that space of what they would tell you can be done to improve it. Like, here's how I believe that it would positively impact our community. Here's how I believe it would positively impact me and my family. And it's more of kind of a holistic viewpoint. And that's where regenerative tourism kind of picks up. And the name of the person who's kind of seen as the leader in the regenerative field and all of our people who respond to the RFP, they should be really well versed in this because if they're working with any gateway and natural amenity communities, all of these things should be on the forefront for them. So they shouldn't have to research it. But um, Anna Pollock is a good resource to be able to look at. She's out of the UK. And I think that she's largely seen as, I guess, the pioneer in that field. And one of the projects with regenerative tourism that gets cited a lot is called Visit Flanders. So if you just Google Visit Flanders, it's community in Brussels who struggles with a lot of those tourism towns of the things that you struggle with but then how do we use this to our economic advantage how do we preserve these beautiful assets that we have and not just sustain them but also you know build around and improve them so those are a good couple of places to go but if the people responding to our rfp have worked with gateway communities before this will not be new to them they should be able to give us the deep dive Uh, Ben's laptop died, so <laughs> let me let me turn on my audio. I think we can hear you and, and at least finish up the meeting this way. Um, Forrest, I think if you can speak, the mic can probably hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, if the, if you speak, the for the microphone can probably hear you here. From wrapping up these comments, I think my my thought would be we're here, and I think we can consider future um, agenda items and right. move, move towards adjournment. Right. Uh, hi there. Um, we are moving towards adjournment. Uh, Melissa, thank you for that and the references to Visit Flanders and Anna Pollock. And uh, what, I, what I found interesting was that the definition that you've used for um, regenerative tourism sounds very much like um, what Brian was talking about in terms of the civic impact and the ecosystem of our community around and growing tourism. So I think that's a useful thing for us. Um, also, I'm simplistic. A, B, C, D is something I can remember. And um, that model, I think, is really one that we can keep in mind. As Chris said, that can be part of the evaluation of contractors. What are you doing there? I found a really good picture of her. Oh, great. Oh, a graph, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Melissa, thank you for that, um, for doing that. You know, we're not operating. I don't know if you and Karen heard that we're not operating in the commission chambers. So, we're um, dealing with some technology issues. Um, the next item, and so thanks to what um, the conversation Chris and, and August have had about how we move forward, we're going to set aside for now, moving forward a mission and vision um, conversation, but we will move to the final item on the agenda, which is uh, consideration of future agenda items.
And remember that our, our May meeting will be focused on the recommendations for expenditure of the TRT and uh, filling out the rural county grant program. Is there anything else? Other ideas, other comments, questions, things Karen, you or Melissa want to add or around the table? Do you want to, uh, Shaley, you want to do a little song and dance about the graph you're looking at? Uh, I was going to email there. Um, Wonderful. Wonderful. Would you send the RFP to Anna Pollock? <laughs> I had it. I had it. I had a big list, so they, they might have been on there. But. You better send it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Bega and, and Brian, thanks for joining us. Brian, thanks for recalling the meeting that we had. And again, I, I remember the fact that people said, but what's the goal? Let's move forward. Um, and uh, I think uh, Lori asked that question. Um, I know that Karen asked that question at our last meeting, what's the goal? So this is why we need to get moving. Yeah. And so Chris is giving us $100,000 more than I thought we were gonna have. That's great. You have your checkbook? Or? <laughs> Let me go over. Okay. Uh, anything else for the video you order? Anything from Karen or Melissa? Okay, do we need a motion to adjourn? No. Yeah. Well, I was going to do that afterwards. So, um, explain yourself, Ben. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we authorized the resignation. Well, the, <laughs> the computer died. I had to go get the charger. And we're talking about resignation. I'm just, uh, just going to try some other things for a little bit. It's been great working with you all. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. And uh, maybe you'll see me in the future as a high rate citizen to be heard at um, your meeting or someone else's meeting. Who knows? You're finally free to speak your mind freely. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll liberate. I'll liberate. Don't hold back. Ben, <laughs> thank you very, very much. You did an amazing work for this group um, and for your department. I mean, I it was amazing how much work you actually produced. So thank you. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Good luck. Very good. Okay. We are adjourned. Thanks. All right.